I'm so glad to welcome you here to the Clark Howard Show. Our mission is to serve you and empower you so you can make better financial decisions in your life. One way we try to do that is through our newsletters. You can sign up at clark.com slash newsletters. You know what our subscription price is? Free. That's right. Today I want to tell you about a trend in investing that has ups and downs. We got to talk about it. And fake online stores have spread like the plague, and it's not always easy to tell the difference. I want to share with you some steps you should take before you click to purchase it could, what could turn out to be a crooked site or just flat out crooks. So a lot of people got into the frenzy of speculation in 20 and 21. And it was all the rage to be on uh, investing message boards. And it was, in many ways, a form of gambling. People were lonely, they were isolated, and people believed what they were seeing on Reddit and at various uh, social media sites. And I have WhatsApp for when I travel. And it's funny with WhatsApp because of all the spying that uh, Meta does with WhatsApp. I remove it, and then when I'm going on a trip again, I add it back on because it's so important when you're traveling outside the United States to have it. But I digress. But people on WhatsApp, every single day when I'm active on WhatsApp, I'm getting things that show up from investing in this, investing in that, investing in the other, and they're trying to get me to join their chat and all that. Well, you know where I'm going with this. So many people got into this speculative fever in investing in stocks, uh, remember when um, the movie theater chain was going way up in value, even though it was on the verge of bankruptcy, and um, GameStop was doing and There were all these stocks that became what they called meme stocks. They were just being fed as stories on message boards, and people were driving the values up, and they were fighting the shorts and all that, and people suddenly on paper were worth a lot of money, and people were doing margin when they were borrowing money and timing in and out of stocks and trading like mad. And there were all these instant millionaires. And now what's happened to those people? So many of them ended up below broke because of the money they borrowed to buy more shares on speculation of various things. And things collapsed and then the crypto thing, it's been ugly. I mean, I think about how many people used to post with fierce anger on Clark Stinks when I would say something about crypto and um, <laughs> a lot of the things people posted, if Krista would read them on Clark Stinks, she had to clean up the language because we're a family-oriented podcast. We couldn't use language like that on our podcast. People were so mad at me and said, I just didn't get it and blah, blah, blah. Um, and now what's happened, a lot of those people having been burned have now sworn off investing. Wrong message to take from what happened. Because what people were doing in 20 and 21 was not investing. It was speculation and gambling. And so people who were buying and selling rapid fire people who were uh, buying and spec all these different cryptos and people that were borrowing on margin. I'm telling you, margin is something. Let me tell you what margin is. Okay, so you own investments and you're like, hey, this thing's got momentum. It's going up. I want to make more money. So they would borrow against their existing shares to then be able to buy more shares and leverage their way up 
But what happens if instead of leveraging up, that holding starts to fall? You get hit with a margin call, which gives you, depending on the broker, minutes, at most maybe an hour or two, to cover that margin call, or they start selling out your positions. And people who were trying to make more money ended up losing, in many cases, all the money they had invested plus. Terribly dangerous. It's playing with fire. So now people are like, I was burned. Never going to do this again. And overwhelmingly, these are people in their uh, teens, 20s, and into their 30s that were involved in all this speculative fever in 20 and 21. Wrong lesson to take that it means you do not invest. Long-term wealth flows to owners. And so use a traditional investing strategy to get back in the game. Be dull. I'm the dullest man alive. Be dull like me. What you do is you buy really dull things through work. I'm going to yawn here. Put your money in the 401k at work. Falling asleep already, right? Doing a Roth IRA. Snoozeville. Put the money into the target retirement fund choice for the year that's realistic for you to retire in that 401k or that Roth IRA. And while you're at it, if you're really young and your employer offers, this, I think three quarters do now, a Roth version of the 401k, do the Roth version of the 401k, do the Roth IRA, and just contribute every pay period into the target retirement fund where it's automatically diversified for you and you don't have to worry about it. you got nothing exciting to talk about on a message board, but down the road, your life becomes exciting because you're going to have money and you're going to have options. You know, so much of what happened in 20 and 21 was people looking for the shortcut. Why would I be a chump and work for decades? I mean, I keep doing this trading. I'm going to be able to retire in three or four months and live the rest of my life on the millions I've made. Yeah. Who did that work out for? Wealth is built over time simply by living on less than what you make and investing the difference. And the more conservative you are with that investing, but it's investing because you're putting it into stock type choices, the more conservative you are, the more you're steady as you go, the more you're the turtle, what happens ultimately, the turtle wins the race. Promise. All right. See, you can't rebut that and say there's somebody you know more dull than I am, right? You're not dull at all, and I think yes, your I audience am. would agree completely. I'm dull. Stephen in Pennsylvania says, to curb the temptation of running up a bigger debt, are you able to ask a credit card company to not increase your spending limit? And if so, is it wise to do so? Uh, depends on the issuer. If they will uh, lower a credit limit for you at your request or not raise your limit. Um, okay, so we're talking about tactics here versus what might happen in your life. There are people, Stephen, who given a higher credit limit, treat it as permission to spend more. If that's you, know thyself. And if that is true, then what you want to do overrides the strategy of wanting higher and higher credit limits because higher credit limits raise your credit score because they lower, unless you, you know your behavior that you would charge up more given a higher limit, what normally happens is people get the higher limit, but their charge volume doesn't go up, which reduces what's known as their utilization of credit, which is roughly a third of what makes up your credit score. People who have turbo high credit scores above 800 have credit utilization ratios below 10%. On the other hand, if your credit utilization the amount of your available credit you're using goes above 30%, 
your score goes down. If you use above 50%, your score nosedives. And so we're talking about two entirely different things here. One, personal behavior, higher credit limit. If it leads to more spending in your life, that higher credit limit is a curse, not a blessing. But in most situations, if it's just about having the best credit profile possible, you want those higher credit limits. Neva in North Carolina says, a friend of mine recently told me that given recent headlines, she feels nervous using TikTok for her small home-based business since the app might access and exploit personal data on her phone. I recommended she purchase an inexpensive tablet and use that exclusively for her business-related social media to keep her personal phone separate. Would you have suggested any other steps? I noticed that Team Clark is on TikTok, and I thought you might have some ideas as both an entrepreneur and a personal privacy aficionado. Yeah, I mean, uh, let's face facts. All right, the Chinese dictatorship um, wants nothing but harm to us. And TikTok is a Chinese company. TikTok's most successful market in the world is the United States. And TikTok faces a credibility issue. That's why so many state governments and local governments around the country have banned their employees from being TikTok on TikTok on any uh, government-issued device or computer or phone. What did we do? TikTok is an important place for us to meet our audience. So what we do is we use a segregated device for TikTok that we use only for that, and that's how we protect ourselves as an enterprise is by having TikTok completely segregated from everything else we do. And to any business owner, I would recommend the same thing. Um, you know, communist China is a complicated entity, complicated country. And the dictator, Xi, has uh, really hurt Chinese capitalism to the point that it's hurting Chinese employment and Chinese economic activity. And now it's like, oops, and is rethinking that and will probably permit in, I would bet, in the not-too-distant future, allow TikTok to segregate American activity from the rest of TikTok activity and hopefully will create safe, secure boundaries that will eliminate TikTok spying by the communists on American people. And we'll see if I'm right about that. Uh, but China is clearly going from being an adversary to being a hostile enemy of the United States. And TikTok will certainly be part of the Chinese effort to undermine Americans, no doubt at all. This is from Andrew in Pennsylvania. I'm a BJ's Wholesale Club member, and I also just signed up for a $19.99 minus $10 gift card introductory offer from Sam's Club. So I certainly like shopping at these types of stores. Sorry, Clark, Costco is a little too far away. I understand that I'm paying a membership fee to get a discount, but everything or most things, maybe not TVs or black shirts, is sold in bulk sizes and amounts. In my opinion, I should be able to pay to get the discount on normal sized items or buy bulk to get the discount. But at a warehouse club, I pay for a membership and I buy bulk to get the discount. Where is my thinking incorrect? Well, your thinking's not incorrect, um, but I did get a real deal on my black shirts. This is a member's mark from Sam's Club. They were on clearance for six ninety one. I have 12 of them <laughs> because I wear them for television and for broadcast the podcast because you never know when something's going to be edited with something else, whatever. So I always wear the same, not the same one, but the same exact shirt, same color, and I saved a ton on these shirts. And they're still looking okay, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So Warehouse Club, if you shop regularly, you will save money. No, nothing you're getting wrong about this. You're completely right. It is a great way for you to save. And coming up straight ahead, it's talking about shopping. When you're shopping online, more and more online shopping is infested with fake retail sites you got to be careful because before you know it, they'll steal your money 
or sell you junk. Social media is so much a part of people's lives. And I'll watch my wife sometimes, who's a big Instagram user, who's scrolling through, I'll be sitting next to her, and she's, uh, she'll see ad after ad after ad for women's clothing brands. And what's become such a problem for her and for so many other people who see something promoted on social media is you'll click to purchase and you don't even realize you're not at the real website of the real seller who supposedly has the deal. And this is a growing, booming scam area that you need to be aware of, that the crooks will pull the architecture identically of the real site. So when you see something, when you're scrolling on social media and an ad pops up and you click on it and you'll be at something that looks exactly like the actual real site that you like to shop at, that you like to buy from. And so this has become such a problem. We have a guide at Clark.com how to spot the phonies. And most of them, you'll know immediately. Now, interestingly enough, I do this anytime I am clicking on any link that's not the actual website itself. And I'm really focused on this right now because our number one tip kept me from getting ripped off just in the last week. I don't know if I told you this, Krista. I don't think you did. I saw an item online on a news site, and there was an ad, and it was a great deal. And I click on it, and it takes me to what looks like the website. But I followed rule number one, which is I moved my mouse up to the URL, the, the web address, and it was phony. Of course, I closed the window right away. And that's one of, we've got deeper steps you can go through. In fact, we have half a dozen where you can make sure that if, see, if it's different. If I go type in blah, blah, blah.com on my computer or the browser on my phone, I'm okay. If I do a Google search for a business, I'm way not okay anymore. Not even close to okay. Or any other search engine. Because so many phonies have managed to get up into those listings when you do a search engine. That again, if you go into that browser, you know, that the do you call it toolbar? What do you am I calling it right? Call it browser? Is mm -hmm. that the yeah, term everybody would understand? Yeah, okay. your web browser. Yeah, so you go up there and you move it in there. It's going to show you if you're actually at the real site. And so I just w simply doing knowing that thing to start with is the first step. Bam, I was out of there. So the deal was fake. And what happens when you're at a fake site is either they just steal money from you and they also have your credit card number. Think about what you give on an online site. You give your credit card number. You give your expiration date. You give your billing zip code. You give your actual address. And you give the three-digit code on the back of a Visa or MasterCard to discover the four-digit code on the front of American Express. Unless you use one of those throwaway credit card number. Which things. is wonderful. Um, if you're not familiar with that, become familiar with it for online shopping. Uh, more and more credit card issuers to deal with the online fraud give you the ability to generate one-time use numbers when you're paying. And then even if you got hoodwinked, the criminals don't have all that information moving forward because that number, that cordons off the harm. But best to prevent the harm in the first place and know these rules. One, 
When you search online for a business, know that many of the search results will be bogus. Two, when you are on social media and an ad pops up, know that the link in that very often will be bogus and it will be a fake promotion, a fake ad. Now, in addition to the URL, we've got five more steps. Just when you're shopping online and you go to a store from a search or you go to a store from an ad, please, before you buy, make sure you're at the real thing. Okay, we'll go to questions now. And this one came in from Dustin in North Carolina. I just married the woman of my dreams. Congratulations, Congratulations. Dustin. Everything is amazing, except now we cannot contribute to a Roth IRA. One of us would have to would max out the Roth 401k contributions as well as a ma max in Roth IRA, while the other would have to split the pre and Roth 401k contributions to bring our income down enough to max a Roth IRA. Okay, now let me stop now. These are good problems to have. Yes. Because it means your combined income puts you into rarefied air. Good situation, not bad. Now, if we both fully max out our pre-tax 401k, we still cannot contribute to a Roth IRA. Do you know why this is? At first, I thought we could file married filing separately, but then the income limit is $10,000. So, Dustin, Congress has these phase-outs on doing Roth IRAs. There are various phase-outs based on income because they're trying to keep all the wealth in the country from flowing just to a small percent of the population. So they do things that disallow things like Roth IRAs. So what you could do, I love that you both have Roth 401ks. And you could do what you said, where you uh, do part pre-tax, uh, traditional 401k, and Roth 401k, and then r remain eligible for the um, Roth IRA. You could do that, and as long as that works for you, keeps you below the threshold. Uh, it's not the worst thing in the world having, as a higher income earner, as a couple, you're in a higher tax bracket, having some of your money go traditional 401k to maintain eligibility for the Roth IRA. And that is a perfectly viable idea you've considered. Second thing you could do, Dustin, is you could just do all Roth 401k up to the max for each of you and then put money in a traditional investment account. Um, go into straight broad market index funds in it. You'll have very favorable tax treatment. And then you have money that's available to you with more flexibility that's not based on having to wait till the government establishes statutory retirement age is eligible to withdraw money from a retirement account, you'd have the flexibility with those monies in a traditional investment account to have it working for you. Um, if you don't have an account with Fidelity, you could open a Fidelity one and do the Fidelity zero, no cost uh, in commissions or in ongoing fees. Their broad market index fund and their international index fund would be an alternative and you wouldn't have to worry about the fact that you've incomed out of doing a Roth IRA. Kristen in Missouri says, I've been listening to Clark for several years and I have really been able to make some money saving changes. A few years ago, I cut the cord and I was able to save a lot of money on my TV and internet. However, my internet service provider has gradually been increasing my rates and my TV service provider has also increased the streaming service. So now it seems like I'm almost back to where I started. I was researching T-Mobile Home Internet, but when I went to the store, they told me that I would have to give them my social security number and I would have to unfreeze my credit with all three bureaus. Should I be concerned with giving them my social? I'm not sure that I will even be happy with the service because I won't know the speeds until I set up the modem at my home. Yeah, so there's a lot of um, disagreement among uh, technology writers about T-Mobile Home Internet, that if you are not somebody who's doing really data-heavy stuff like uh, gaming or you're producing 
video or audio content. You're just consuming content and you're not gaming. People seem to be very happy with the T-Mobile home internet and it is a whole lot cheaper. Uh, you may be able to avoid all the uh, security freeze thaws and providing your social security number if you go to a, um, a Metro by T-Mobile store which they own as their prepaid provider, and you could get the T-Mobile home internet from them at, I think, the same exact monthly price, and then there's no credit check that's involved with them wanting your social security number and you having to go through the thaw and all that. And you could try the T-Mobile home internet. If it works for you, you're good. You save so much money versus being with one of the cable monsters, you'd cut your internet cost probably in half being with T-Mobile Home Internet. I should mention that AT&T is planning in 23 to launch their own wireless home internet as well. And Verizon has one also that is a Verizon wireless home internet. So this is an alternative to the cable monsters is an increasingly possible possibility. Just you can't be somebody who is gaming because you're going to lose every game you play. What you find about the I'm not Metro? sure. I just pulled up their website and it's saying to check eligibility. And it says try it for 60 days mm -hmm. or you get your device payment refunded. Okay. Uh, Carrie in Alabama wrote in with this. I just got back from a trip on a big airline. Both ways, I got a message on the check-in screen that said it was a very full flight, and if I wanted to be able to bring a carry-on and overhead storage, I'd need to pay an extra $20 or $40. Both times, the plane was not full, and there was plenty of overhead storage. Clark, this seems dishonest and just wrong to me. I want to keep my flexibility by not checking a bag like you taught me. It seems like the airline knows this and is trying to change the terms of the ticket I bought to make extra money. This is wrong, wrong, wrong. Usually if a plane is really full, they offer to gate check your bag. But in one of these instances, they were forcing passengers to check bags through to their final destination. I don't know how to pack for an airline trip now. I guess I've got to be get everything into a backpack. How frustrating when I'm paying a full fare airline. So I know about this. This is American Airlines mm -hmm. is the only airline I know doing this. And so what American's doing is trying to psych its customers out who are carry on only and say, hey, you know what? Uh, wow, there's just not going to be a place for your bag. So uh, uh, if you pay them, they let you board earlier is what they're doing. And then they're assuring you then there's going to be overhead bend space. Don't let Americans psych you out. They're just trying to be uh, money grubbing with your wallet. And uh, only if people bite on this and let American rip them off will American continue to use this. It's just an experiment at this point. It is really underhanded and I think despicable of American Airlines to do this. And... Don't pay them the fee. Um, as for the issues with baggage, all right, this is classic economics. Airlines used to allow you to check bags for free. There was never a problem with overhead bend space. And then the full fare airlines decided, and then several of the discounters decided there was real money to be made in this. They all started charging these ripoff fees for checking a bag, except for Southwest, two bags fly free per person. Um, so now, you when you fly, because I fly everybody, and I fly Southwest a lot, I fly other airlines, Southwest virtually never do they have to gate check a bag, because people just um, will check their bags for the most part. There's plenty of overhead bend space almost always. I was on a Southwest flight recently that they took two people, the last two people to board, they were out of overhead bend space, and they checked their bags underneath. But again, there was no cost. What the airlines are, are doing by charging these ultra-high baggage checking fees is people are 
modifying how they travel. They're taking a carry-on only. And now there's not enough room in the end. There's not enough room for all the bags. And then particularly if you're a lower level boarder, you're later in the boarding process, they're making you get gate check. But again, that is free. And don't let American cheat you and rip you off and run off with additional money for your trip. And I want to thank you so much for listening today. I hope the rest of your day is absolutely great.